welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Steve Bauer. I uh, lead the search infrastructure team at uh, Bloomberg. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit today. Uh, well, actually, I'll give a little background. I, I've been working in search uh, for about 16 years. Uh, first at a company called Fast Search and Transfer, and then another little Boston-based uh, search company called Ativio. Uh, and uh, came to Bloomberg about four years ago uh, to start this uh, search infrastructure team. Uh, and uh, we've been kind of going at it. So this is like kind of a little historical view of what we've done and talking about stuff. But uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ken, who will kind of give you a little introduction and get started. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So my name is Ken Laporte. I've been on, at Bloomberg for about six years, most of that on the search infrastructure team, uh, working on, well, exactly what we're going to discuss today. Uh, before that, I was at BarnesandNoble.com working on their homegrown search engine. So between Steve and I, we have a, a decent amount of experience, but not as much as some of the people in this room, I'm sure. So before I get started, a, a few words about Bloomberg. Bloomberg is the world's largest provider of financial news, information, and research. Our goal is really to develop uh, products that uh, provide our clients with the best data as quickly as possible. Um, obviously, accuracy, speed, and reliability are critical to that. So information retrieval systems like solar are critical. So why are we giving this talk? Well, no, we're not geniuses, not by, not by a long shot. Um, but we did spend a lot of time, effort, and money figuring out problems both in our platform and solar, uh, and we want to share that knowledge with you so that you might benefit should you, have to, should you be in a similar situation. So search is nothing new at Bloomberg. Uh, the company's been around for over 30 years. Uh, like Steve mentioned, our group's only been around for four. So what did we have before? Well, our goal was always rapid delivery of products to clients. Uh, whatever solution made sense for that application team, that's what they went with, uh, regardless of whether it was the best solution for Bloomberg as a whole. Um, this led to a lot of proprietary open source and commercial products being used throughout the company and really created fragmented solutions. Uh, these are costly, they're difficult to maintain, uh, there's no standardization, there's custom code to do ingest to uh, start things up, and it's really just a mess. Um, so one of the goals was to kind of address, address this problem. So how did we get started? So about four years ago, um, the, the, the company decided to create a team of search specialists, uh, people who have backgrounds in search along with uh, Bloomberg Technologies and so, uh, a team that could come up with a platform that the rest of, that the, rest of the company could build on. Um, so we reviewed existing applications and existing search applications to find out uh, if we could pick out a few of them, come up with a representative use cases, and, and really kind of show what our platform could do. Um, we wanted to focus on a few things, so uh, two of them were different scales. Uh, we wanted to make sure that whatever solution, whatever platform we came, with, came up with scaled appropriately for any, anything we could come up with. Uh, various data types, um, on the bottom left you can see uh, this, some geospatial data types were one of our first collections, um, and all sorts of different requirements. Um, the top right graph is actually, uh, <laughs> kind of cut off a little bit, but the top right uh, represents a uh, heavy analytics uh, uh, function. Um, Steve, as well as one of the other members of our team, built an entirely new analytics component that's now a contrib module uh, in solar uh, to, to solve some of the business problems that they had. So why solar? Uh, I think everyone in this room is familiar with a lot of the benefits of solar, but why did we specifically choose it? Well, we evaluated plenty of open source as well as some commercial products, um, but it was already he heavily used at Bloomberg. There were already teams using it, people already had knowledge about it, and it had a large community such as yourselves uh, supporting it. Um, it was established, and four years ago, I think when you started it was like 4-4 that you were started with, 4-6. Um, and if you just think about all the changes that have happened since then, uh, we kind of predicted that there was going to be a large and growing feature set, as well as in increases to scalability and stability. But finally, Bloomberg was... Is your mic? Yeah. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> um, Bloomberg wanted to start really committing to open source, um, not just fixing the bugs that, that uh, hampered our progress, 
but also make changes to the core engine itself and to have that flexibility. So what did we come up with? We came up with search as a service. Uh, nothing terribly new to a lot of the people. In fact, I think there was uh, a talk just before this about search as a service. Um, but it was search as a service to our own company. Um, we wanted to create an, a really strong and uh, vibrant platform for our application teams. And that started off with a middleware that we affectionately call the proxy. Um, and I don't see the author of the proxy in here right now. <laughs> um, it, it had a familiar and lightweight API that Bloomberg application developers uh, were gonna feel very comfortable using. It already had plenty of support within the company. Um, it also provided things like monitoring, uh, alarming, um, and in one of the things that people really liked about it is that it, we could create a simplified API that that would use that would wrap some of, some, uh, some of Solar's more complicated APIs. Um, but that wasn't enough because some of our tenants required, had even uh, had specialized uh, requirements that required the ability to have complete pass-through so that whatever f features they wanted to use of Solar, they could use whenever they wanted to. So we started, it was great. So four years ago, uh, we had, I think we started with three or four collections, and now there's over 300 teams that we support. This graph I think is a little out of date, um, but it re represents a diverse use of, of business problems, scales, uh, and it also really solved, uh, addressed one of the main goals, which was to displace other technologies and centralize on our platform. Um, here are some scale numbers that we, that we kind of put up to give you a sense of what we deal with, but I think it's important to talk about scales more than just the number of documents. Um, to us, scale means <clears throat> quite a few things. It's uh, your ingest rate. You know, some of our collections are ingesting at incredibly high rates. Your query rate, um, we have collect we've noticed that, hey, you can ingest at high rates, but once you start querying at high rates too, along with that, you run into problems and how do you solve those? We have collections where each document is just a few bytes, you know, it's an ID and maybe another field, like a key value pair. And we have, doc we have uh, collections where the documents are hundreds of megabytes apiece. So how do we scale in all those ways and support all those various use cases? Um, one of the other things that I want to mention kind of on this slide is that after four years, we have over 300 teams that we're working with and these teams are really mission critical to Bloomberg uh, and the financial markets as a whole. So our platform has to be reliable at any scale that we support. So great, four years later, and now we're starting to see the problems. Actually, it was really two years later that we started seeing some of these problems arise. Uh, the first was that although our collections, the number of collections and teams that we supported scaled, our, our human base didn't scale with that. Uh, it started off with a team of three and then was the team of five for quite a while. Um, and we, we just couldn't support all the business use cases that we were, that we were running up against. Um, our alarming that we, that we had was simple, but kind of ineffective. We were getting a lot of false alarms. Uh, any sort of flutter would cause a, a middle of the night phone call, uh, something that we really wanted to avoid, and Steve's gonna talk about that uh, at length. Our build process, it, we weren't just taking a standard build of solar, we also had a few patches uh, that we were applying, some things that we were backporting, um, and our build process was manual um, and was, had very lim lim uh, limited testing. So whenever we released something, there was a, a large amount of risk. Um, so our solar releases were a lot slower than they should have been. Um, configuration management uh, originally was a very big problem, and to some extent it still is. Uh, and Steve's gonna talk about some of the details about that and how we're tackling that problem. And finally, there were a lot of known unknowns. We knew that there were problems. Uh, we were working thoroughly to identify and address them, but there were things that we just couldn't explain right away. Um, but over time, I think we've gotten to the point where we've identified most of our problems and we've worked through them and we're gonna talk about how we did that. So the first challenge that we tackled was our ecosystem. Um, what are the problems that we faced? Well, we're providing a platform for our, our application developers. So who owns the data? The data is residing on our servers, 
Are we just custodians of that data? Do they own the services around? Who owns what? Who is responsible for what? And in the middle, in the middle of the night when something goes wrong, who gets woken up? Um, so where does that line live? Um, how do they scale? You know, all too frequently, we'd have a collection owner that comes to us and say, uh, yeah, I'm gonna have 100 documents in our collection, and the next thing we know, they have a billion documents. Um, how do we predict that scale? How do we mo monitor for it? And how do we address it? Um, and then finally, and this is something that was very challenging for, for me personally, is educating our tenants, saying they were all very used to databases. How does that transition to search? Uh, how, do you, how do you make that mental switch? Um, it required a lot of education. Uh, everything from what are the various data types available, uh, what are the various uh, um, analyzing chains that, that you could use. Uh, this was a struggle for our, a lot of our tenants because there's so much availability in solar for, for these things. Um, how do you do relevance? Uh, relevance is not heavily used at Bloomberg, but where it is, it's, it's critical. Um, so this, is, this was a new feature. This was something that was newly available to our, a lot of our tenants, and they didn't really know how to tune appropriately. So we had to work with them quite a bit on that. And what are the available features? Um, one of the features that's heavily used is faceting. I think most people in here use faceting. But what is faceting doing? What are the limits of it? Uh, everything, other things like block join. Um, I see Dennis back there. He, he was working on a, a streaming expressions and he started doing some education internal to the company on that too. So the way we solve this is, is kind of a four part process. The first part is we ask our tenants to fill out a survey so that we can understand what their business requirements are, what the problem that they're trying to solve is, what the scale is, and, and, and what, their, what special requirements they may or may not have. Um, it also, um, it also gives us an opportunity to meet with them and figure out how to best structure their documents with them, uh, how to do any sort of uh, query, help them with whatever query design they have, and address any concerns that they have. Uh, it's similar if you're in like the professional services world to the pre-sales process, um, where you know, if they have concerns about what's the stability, what's the response times, uh, what are the SLAs, anything like that, we can talk about it with them. Um, and on the very, very, very rare case, some of the concerns that our team has, like, is this is search really the right solution for you? Um, if anyone was at Stump the Chump last night, you might have heard me talk about a collection that came to us and said, hey, we want to have 100 million fields in our, in our collection. And that obviously was not the best, solar's not the best use case for that. And we kind of worked with them to figure out what would be a better, better solution. Um, all right, so now they have their collection. How do they go about using it? Um, we developed a system uh, where we can, we can share with them the best practices of, of search about solar, our platform, uh, how best to use it, how to get the most out of it. Um, sorry. We provide documentation, code samples, the, the, the things that you normally would. But on top of that, uh, we hold office hours regularly where people come to us and spend hours bending our ears and asking us questions. Um, trying to come up with new ideas for, the, for their applications as well as our platform. Um, we have a support chat where, that's frequently used that is not only supported by uh, our, the search infrastructure team, but sometimes questions are even answered by our application teams as well uh, around search and our platform. Um, and finally, there was, there was a push to do community development. Um, we want to make sure that uh, Bloomberg application developers are learning from not only us, but also each other. Um, we, wanna, we want them to publish their own code, we want to make it available to them, and even uh, contribute back to solar and the open source community as a whole. Next thing, so now they have their, now they have their collection, they have their code. How do we get this out into production? How do we make sure that it's going to work for their clients? Um, how do we provision the hardware? This is something that took us a long time to get right. Um, everything from uh, how do you scale, how do you make sure that the deployments are automated, um, which is actually something that we're still struggling with. Uh, we had a process that used to take anywhere from uh, an hour to, and now takes just a handful of minutes. Um, we also had special requirements like, how do I have my hot and cold collection? Um, 
this is something that we, we are doing less often these days, uh, but it's, it's a requirement for some of our, our tenants, as well as load testing. Uh, this is something that we have put a lot of effort into and a lot of money behind. We want to make sure that when, our, when these collections go and are available for application developers, that they're always going to be scaled appropriately, that the hardware is going to be there, and it, on day one it's working the way it should. And finally, maintain and grow. These things don't stay static. Um, people's data, people's uh, processes, people's business requirements do change over time. So how do we, how do we handle that? Well, it kind of feeds back into the survey. Um, they tell us, hey, I'm going to go and ingest another 100 million records. I'm going to ingest a billion more records. Uh, next year, we're going to release this feature to you know, five more clients, and we expect our query rate to triple. Um, so we work with them to make sure that as these things go, uh, our platform is capable of supporting them. Um, a second to that is we're always upgrading our platform, um, be it uh, the layer above solar that we have as well as solar itself. Um, one of the interesting things that we're going through now is upgrading from four to five uh, and going through that process with our tenants. And we found some interesting things along, those, along that path. Um, and finally, monitoring. How do we monitor? Uh, Stephen mentioned that yesterday that we have over 5,000 solar instances. How do we monitor all of those? And I will turn it over to Steve to talk more about that. Cool. A little clicky thing. Um, yeah, to, uh, to Ken's point about uh, the kind of organization uh, of the team and, and, and how we operate, it, we really are act like a, like a professional services organization inside the company. Um, and we really, it's like, it's kind of an ongoing engagement process, which is a pretty, pretty neat thing to be able to do. So um, <clears throat> I'll dive a little bit into monitoring. Um, I, probably the biggest challenge, as Ken mentioned, is like we have an enormous monitoring footprint. Um, we have yeah, north of uh, 5,000 solar processes running, probably representing somewhere around 600 or more, maybe close to 900 individual solar clouds that are running um, all the time. Uh, and we, you know, we need to monitor that. It's a huge amount of data that you need to kind of crunch through and keep track of in order to do that. Um, the, uh, the other part, part of it is that <coughs> There are lots of things that you can actually monitor. You know, is it like, is this box running? Is, uh, you know, is the jetty process that's running solar actually up and running? Um, is the, you know, is it cluster state? Is it, uh, you know, uh, any number of different things we could look at. Um, and the other thing is, uh, is, you know, as Ken mentioned before, that was a huge, had a huge impact on us was uh, false alarms. So like, you know, you get an alarm in the middle of the night, um, someone gets woken up, they have to get, you know, log in, figure out what's going on. Um, the, the good thing about this is that solar is actually really good um, in terms of recovering and taking care of these things. So usually it was like you log in and you look and you say, yep, it's about to finish recovering and you move on, but you still got woken up at three in the morning. Um, but solar can lie to you. So there's sometimes there's been bugs uh, that we found where you know it, everything looks like it's doing well, but one of the nodes is just kind of like off in its own little universe and, uh, and it's kind of telling you that it's okay, but it's really not. Um, thankfully, like most of this has been squashed out, so we <laughs> don't see this too much anymore. Um, and lastly, uh, we have an, our, our team is kind of verticalized, so we have infrastructure people as well as you know developers and SREs and things like that, uh, you know, looking at these things. Um, but everyone cares about different things. Like the, our you know DevOps guys, SREs care about like the servers and are the servers working? Uh, you know, is there any sort of system health issues there? You know, uh, all the way through, you know, the, the, the actual solar processes, our proxies, all these different things. Um, and then you have kind of active things, like when you get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're going to try to figure out what's going on right now. You need to have accurate current status um, and versus, like, more forensic things, right? Something OOMs in the middle of the night, uh, you're not going to go through and dive into that OOM right then. You might just increase the heap size on something and wake up in the morning and then you want to go back at the thing and be able to, you know, look at kind of forensically what's going on. Um, so how did we kind of address this? Um, <coughs> the first thing we, we realized is that we need to monitor via multiple mecha mechanisms. So whether it's, you know, uh, kind of pinging the solar processes uh, or looking at cluster state, um, you know, making sure the processes are running on the boxes. So kind of taking all that information and then aggregating it all together. Um, 
and, 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 and only alarming it when you have multiple signals that actually confirm that there's something wrong. Uh, and uh, as well as kind of um, w like waiting for, like there's, there are things that are kind of interstitial problems like, oh, this thing, or ephemeral problems like, oh, this thing went into recovery but it came back. Do I really want to wake something up or alarm on it or I just want to notify that like this event did happen and we should probably look at what happened but it's not a problem. Um, so like something goes into recovery, it comes back in two seconds, eh, well, okay, we'll look at it tomorrow. If you maybe had one solar collection, you might really care about, about that, but with so many instances and things like that, it's, it's too much to worry about. Um, you kind of have to look at it in a systemic way. And really the way we did that is uh, we built this piece of software called Night Owl. And uh, Night Owl, uh, you can see a screenshot and I'll talk a little bit about it in a second. Um, <coughs> is uh, basically a tool that lets us monitor solar's, uh, solar, Zookeeper. It has kind of like a generic component and we're adding other things like Kafka and uh, console and stuff like that to it um, to be able to monitor all the different services in our platform in a very active way. Um, it is by itself distributed and scalable so that we can add any number of uh, different collections and things like that. And it actually takes all this event information that it's aggregating and indexes into a separate solar collection, which gives us kind of that active view as well as the historic like forensic information so we can go back and look at what happened last night. Oh, I saw this node go down at this time and come back up at this time and then this one went down and that one came up. We can kind of replay the events. Um, and this tool has really, really like led to some massive stability improvements across the fleet because now we have this view of the kind of state of our system at, in all, in, at all times. Um, the view on the right, you can see um, at the top, you, that top section, uh, you have those little kind of uh, chiclets or whatever you want to call them, um, representing uh, some of them, like the ones that are highlighted and, and, and some of them that are red and whatever are actually individual servers, but we actually have enough servers that we can't put them all on the screen and just update the display. So anything that's like a whole rack that where every machine in the rack is in good state, uh, it just rolls up the whole rack and says like, rack is good. Um, eventually we'll actually even compress those down and get more racks. The middle section are actually individual collections, um, all of which are running for the most part in separate solar clouds. And uh, they get highlighted uh, based on like they're, they're gone, they're in recovery, they're bad. You know, the standard kind of solar states at the top, which is a little bit cut off, there's actually a search box above that and you can filter and you can just say like, just show me the things that are not, a you know, not active. So you can just like, the screen is blank until something goes wrong. And then you can click on individual collections and actually see all the shards um, and you know, who's the leader currently, uh, you know, what hosts and so forth, and, and see which, you know, actually see the pieces that are, so it's kind of like a high level, medium level, fine grained view um, that you can, you can look at. And then this, the back end of the service um, is actually generating alarms and stuff off. Um, and it has a nice little uh, searchable interface, inter like a search API internally um, that has like an in-memory solar. Um, so you can actually filter through and say, you know, show me the last, you know, changes since yesterday or whatever. Um, um, so, like I was saying, uh, this led to some pretty substantial um, uh, kind of stability in, in, uh, in our platform. Uh, the first thing we realized is that we were, um, we started, started seeing lots and lots of processes uh, basically going into recovery and then they would just recover sometimes quickly, sometimes you know not so quickly, but sometimes like you, something would go into recovery and when it was under high query load or two nodes would go into recovery and then they would start you know, recovering from the leader which would cause load on the leader which would then crash or you know, OOM or something like that and then the whole, that whole cloud would just kind of spiral down and just die um, and so we needed to figure this out. <laughs> Um, the first thing we found is uh, it, we found a very interesting bug uh, brought out. We used to uh, use a profiler called Yorkit, which is actually a really great piece of software. I'm not like endorsing it, but it, it's very helpful to us. Um, and we used to actually run this um, all the time. <laughs> um, we used to run this uh, in our processes all the time. And uh, so that if we needed to profile an application, we could just you know, say activate the profiler and off we go without having to restart the processes. Um, there's a, it has a very weird interaction with memory map uh, when, when you're using a memory map directory where like every two to three weeks you would get a garbage collection pause that would be like 17 minutes. And uh, of course that just you know, sends everything off. And it was something that only cropped up after two or three weeks, but we could actually see that pattern 
and then try to you know tear down into it and finally figured that out. Um, the other thing we notice is lots of uh, young generation pressure during ingest. So we have lots of people doing really high performance injects, some of them up to like 20,000 records a second um, into, into, this, into the system. And, uh, and this caused lots of uh, young generation pressure, which would generate uh, young generation GC pauses um, that sometimes took longer than 15 seconds, which would cause the nodes to go into recovery and you know rinse, lather, repeat kind of thing. Um, uh, the thing we learned from that is, and I guess the stump the chump yesterday, there's giving opposite advice, but using G1C, GC with uh, parallel ref proc, pretty much uh, we went from having several hundred of these events that would happen over the course of a day where a node would go into recovery because of a long GC uh, to having like uh, maybe a dozen or two dozen over the course of a day. So like an order of magnitude change um, in the number of GCs across the fleet. We still have issues with GC, but they're more tied to specific application use cases which we can target um, and either fix like, usually it's a matter of like fixing the way that their data is structured or whatever rather than you know trying to tune GC. I, I feel like generally trying to tune GC is kind of like a, once you get there you've already lost kind of. Um, the, the other thing is uh, long recovery times. So uh, as I was saying, we would see these nodes go into recovery and sometimes nodes recover quickly from the transact, you know, and, and, and they would come back up because they're relatively small, but we have some larger collections, which um, uh, basically they would go into recovery and they would always do a snap pull and have to resync the whole index down um, to, to the, the node that failed, which for two terabytes, you know, at 20 gigabit is uh, like in about a half an hour uh, to recover, which is, really fast and solar will actually recover and use like basically a full 20 gigabit connection to do that recovery, but a half an hour of like syncing from a leader uh, can be pretty painful. Um, and so what we found, uh, and on the right there's a bunch of issues that are either in solar right now or that, we're, that are um, being worked on to get into solar. Um, we found a whole bunch of issues around index finger uh, in index fingerprinting as well as um, we're working to do s uh, to allow you to extend the sizes of the transaction logs so you can recover from the transaction logs when you're feeding at twenty thousand records a second. Oh, um, thank you. Did this die? Oh, thank you. There it goes. It'll be right back in a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, uh, basically the transaction logs in solar are really, really short. Um, so if you're feeding at any sort of really serious rate, um, not even that like 20,000 rate, but anything you know reasonable, you almost never can recover from the transaction logs, which will end up doing snap pull or pure sync or whatever. Um, and so we have a whole bunch of work we're doing on that so that we can actually recover quicker. So when we do have these issues, so forth. Um, and like I was saying, there's, there's some other solar bugs there that we found along the way. Um, with replicas getting out of sync or you know zookeeper issues and things like that. And the last thing that we is like really pretty much the only thing that causes problems for us um, that you know on a systemic level that we haven't really completely squashed out but we've made better is out of memory exceptions. We have as Ken was saying, you know, th you know 300 different application teams doing 300 different things, all you know, smart engineers trying out, hey, maybe I'll just try uh, my huge collection, I'll just run a wildcard query on it today for A star, and you know, the thing just pops. And so you get these kind of one-off things where someone was playing around with something, um, and that, that caused you know, an issue. And uh, really to deal with that, um, I think Solar 5 started shipping with this out of memory killer where it'll just like kill minus nine the process um, if, uh, if it gets an OOM. And we do the same thing. We actually archive off all the, we uh, turn on the, uh, what is it called, the heap dump on out of memory exception. So we take the heap dump and kind of archive it off um, so that we can go back forensically and look at it later, kill off the process, it restarts, resyncs, everything is fine. We don't get woken up at night. We have, but then we kind of aggregate that and say like, oh, if this thing is repeatedly getting OOMs, then we need to have someone look at it so we set our off alarm. The biggest, Real, you know, like the probably 95th percentile case for why this is, is people are not using doc values. So they'll have a relatively large collection, they'll run a query. We try to keep our heap sizes really small, around six gigs. Um, and you can put huge numbers of documents into a collection that has six gigs heap size, like hundreds of millions of records into that small of a heap, as long as you're using doc values for everything. As soon as you try to fasten on a field that doesn't have doc values, it'll just blow up. 
um, uh, and then we just you know have them turn on doc values and move on from there because everything can be off heap. Um, yeah. yeah. The next challenge uh, really is uh, was around configuration management, and this is kind of a uh, area that is still like progressing for us. Uh, we're we're getting closer to where we want to be. Um, but uh, basically, early on, we had the kind of a very deployment-oriented process. So we would get an updated config, and we would push it out to the nodes, and it was like this kind of um, it, there was not a lot of structure around it. And uh, we also had people that want to be able to like either like version or roll back their schemas, and you know certain things can be rolled forward but not back, and dealing with those kinds of things. Um, and that required individuals on our team to actually like know that that was a problem or going to be a problem and so forth um, to, to be able to do that. And it just didn't kind of scale. We kind of had this template-oriented system um, that was really simple for the, like when we first started out, we were looking at very simple use cases. And as that grew and we started getting people getting custom field types, then we had multiple templates and then it just became this kind of complete mess. Um, and all of this basically had a lack of provenance. So we couldn't look at a production system and say, this is the version of the schema they, they were running with, that came from this version of the template, that came from this version of the software, blah, 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 blah. We had some ideas, but you, know, you could get some weird cases where you didn't really know. Um, oh, wrong one. So what do we do? So we basically converted this, and we're still in the process of rolling this out all the way for all of our collections, but we created a software development process rather than a kind of more of the deployment oriented process. Um, we basically take each of our tenants configurations, we store them in a separate Git repo that is actually a little Maven project. Um, and, and when you build a Maven pro project, it'll produce a, like a tar file that has their config directory, basically what you would see in Zookeeper. Um, and it publishes that into uh, Artifact. We use our Artifactory internally, but uh, any sort of artifact repository, it publishes that tar file, um, you know, built, you know, as part of that Maven process, and then uh, we automate this through Jenkins. Um, and this basically allows us to have, like, versioned, we put that, we actually run these things through, like, the standard Git flow kind of branching model and everything like that. So we get a pull request from a, develop, from a developer saying, hey, I want to add these three new fields to my schema. Uh, uh, and th I'll talk about the kind of validation stuff in a second. We can validate it and then, uh, uh, you know, put it through that process version it, put it into the artifact repository. Everything gets tagged in Git and everything is, you know, we basically get provenance for that. We, it's not, it's like we treat it as software rather than just this configuration. Um, the, the, this, the, the really interesting piece, which is, uh, we're still working, getting all the pieces worked out on, is uh, basically validating. And so uh, the, the, the thing here is basically looking at the schemas, looking at your previous version of your schema, identifying what's changed, and actually uh, validating that those changes are legitimate. So can you turn this string field to an integer field? No. Okay, then I reject your pull request. All right, uh, and, and those kinds of things. So we prevent people from uh, you know, doing things that will break stuff downstream where we would deploy the schema and then try to start it up and it would fail. And then someone would have to go look at it and then it takes time and energy from, our, you know, from humans. Uh, as well as eventually want to add integration testing so that you could build a unit test that would get run when it runs the Maven you know, build process that would go out, spin up a solar you know, instance with your, your configuration, run that, test it, potentially like have like an old copy of an index from the last time you ran your unit tests, try to load the old index with the new con you know, schema, do all kinds of stuff like that. We haven't gotten quite there yet, but that's the, the end goal. And then at the end, all this gets deployed out into Zookeeper just like you would. Um, we don't use the kind of schema APIs in Solar right now. Uh, maybe we'll look at that, but we, it, this also allows us to, we, we kind of put some extra metadata into Zookeeper so we know everything that went in, check some for all of those files, all that kind of stuff, so we can know exactly, you know, did someone go into Zookeeper and just modify this thing? Because um, they were testing or whatever. Um, and the last piece, and I probably have a very short amount of time, uh, is infrastructure. And uh, <coughs> basically, uh, you know, you can see that chart that Ken showed earlier. Uh, rolling out infrastructure uh, was, is a really problematic thing. Uh, we had a lot of demand. Um, you know, our existing infrastructure way to deploy infrastructure is really slow um, in terms of building out new infrastructure and getting the quantities we wanted. And we also had kind of all kinds of different requirements in terms of scale and security and, you know, this team wants, 
more memory, less memory, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And I had basically too many pets. Um, and, and so like, all these little kind of custom little one-off things um, just doesn't scale. And so what we did is uh, we built a new process. We kind of uh, verticalized the team. So we have both infrastructure people um, as well as uh, you know, software people and everything like that. And we built a new system from the ground up in a kind of very layered approach. Um, you can see here we have like, you know, kind of hardware stuff, a control plane that lets us manage what processes are running where, the actual applications themselves and the APIs. And so we kind of use all of this. Um, and I can point you to some talks that we've done other places about that aspect of what we've done, but uh, probably too much for today. But all of this is kind of managed as part of like a software development process, which we actually use for managing all of our infrastructure. So if you want to roll out some new package onto a box, it's like you put a pull request in to you know, our, our GitHub, and that gets built by Jenkins and pushed out and rolled out into the production systems um, using things like Chef and uh, Vagrant and stuff like that. Um, and the last piece of this is we did, we've done a, a huge amount of testing on hardware, trying all the kinds of th different things. It's, it's a very obvious statement. Better hardware is a better experience. Um, uh, basically run everything on SSDs, um, very fast SSDs, lots of RAM. You know, We pretty much run like half terabyte of RAM in all of our boxes and a uh, faster network. So either 20 or 40 gig network. Solar will use all of this stuff. And when you do it, it just makes dealing with these problems across our whole fleet of infrastructure just substantially easier to deal with. Um, we're not trying to nitpick like, oh, we're going to add an extra 20 gigs of RAM on this box. It's just like, this is what we do. If you need to go bigger or wider, we just go bigger and wider. So uh, lastly, what's next? Um, this whole thing is, gonna, is getting moved into kind of a containerized environment. Um, so we're looking at all kinds of different orchestration tools and things like that. Um, it'll give us like lots of um, good things like better, more clear metrics um, and uh, kind of decentralize some of the control of uh, uh, how we manage things. Um, we're starting to shift into a mode where we're kind of delegating control. So we have some teams, that some of who are presenting uh, here uh, over the last couple of days uh, that are doing really interesting things that are, they need more control over what they're doing than just like an API where they can send data. So we're kind of like, uh, kind of even further segmenting our cluster so we can support those types of use cases, but also give them the tools like metrics and things like that that they need in order to do their business. Um, as well as like directing alarms and stuff like that to them so that when they're working on things and you know they have their custom code or whatever, uh, it doesn't wake us up, they get woken up and then we can kind of act as like a level three support kind of situation. Um, and then uh, basically being able to detect, we can detect failures when they happen, we'd like to be able to detect failures before they happen. We have a lot of data coming in which allows us to potentially build like machine learned models or heuristics to say like, oh, I see this behavior, it's been happening. Actually, I'll tell you that it's going to break before it breaks. And then, you know, so that, that's really to make a better experience for our clients, right? Because something breaks, the client sees it, that's not a good thing. Uh, we want to not have that ever happen. Um, and, and just some general solar stuff we're working on, kind of unrelated to everything, but I'll throw it in here. Lots of work on streaming. Dennis gave his talk yesterday on streaming. Um, so there's going to be a lot more going on there. We have a new version of the analytics module that's in solar. Um, that'll have distributed analytics and pivot facet support and a bunch of other things hopefully coming along soon. But uh, I guess that's it. We're probably out of time anyway. So. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, listening to us today. And of course, I'll say this, but we're hiring. So if anyone's interested, uh, drop by our booth or get in touch with anyone from Bloomberg and we're gonna have a chat. So. It's all on-prem, on physical gear. Uh, we looked at putting this stuff on VMs, but a lot of the applications we have will actually like fully tax like a big, beefy machine. So kind of, we, 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 for a while, we've run in kind of a hybrid mode where we had some things in VMs. Internally, we have like OpenStack and things like that. Um, internally, uh, we found that it's just easier to put, especially when you move to containers, when you can like res resource constrain the containers, you actually, it's just as, you're actually probably better uh, running this stuff in containers on physical gear. And the way we manage our physical gear is basically the same way. We actually use Vagrant for managing our physical hardware. Um, we have some plugins we wrote for that um, and that allow us to treat physical gear as like VMs, basically. Um, and so we just do it like that.
you know. That's a good question. Um, uh, so in, in terms of like, uh, you know, how we get direction and things like that, um, there's obviously like high level directions uh, in terms of like, hey, this is what we need. Um, but actually it's, I wouldn't say it's developer led, uh, it's led by us on the team. So we're, we're, because we have a view of like all these different types of applications, we look at them and say like, well, if we did this, it would make like this many people's lives better. Right, and um, in terms of demonstrating the business value, like that chart is all we have to show people, right? Like we, there are 300 teams that either, you know, they were building custom software, like, they're, like for that analytics app in the beginning that we looked at, they had like three or four people working on this custom analytics code that lived like in memory and did all these things and that is replaced by a module that we don't even have to maintain, right? It's in solar, it's moving forward, that's like, they're done, There's <laughs> they can go off and build new you know screens and functions and things like that without having to to do that so it's been pretty good from that and and as a kind of cultural thing in bloomberg uh that's kind of very very much how it is it's like you, every team is kind of like a mini startup and you know if you can show value you get funded and you do your thing so to answer your other question we have about 10 people now okay. yeah <laughs> so and, and and my hope is to not grow that too much like there's obviously like some growth that we need in order to support ongoing things and we have much, like when we first started out, everything was like a single sharded collection, relatively small, and then like, you know, two years in, all the people that were like, I'm not so sure if you guys are doing the right thing, they're like, okay, it's working, okay, I wanna do this thing and it's gonna be, you know, 300 nodes by itself. And, and then, you're, then you have to kind of figure out how to scale to deal with that. And so that, uh, there, there's been a lot of that change in, in over the time, it's like, okay, we're gonna put on like our, uh, big boy pants and like, you know, <laughs> really get down to it, so. Uh, Sorry. Mentioned you mentioned like a uh, high high cost, high adoption. Can you talk about your um, giving out employees and uh, benefits and then why you're not using them anymore? Um, well, one of the, re it's really uh, application developer team for uh, requirements that they have should failure occur or, or they have a cold collection for quality checking. Um, some people want to do ingest and then atomic switch over. Um, that's, that's usually the, the case for it to us. It's just, hey, this collection is being used, this collection isn't right now. It's a resource utilization problem, not really a, a, a uh, business problem. Yeah. Yeah. It, it starts affecting things like how, how we kind of like build this stuff back and, you know, are, oh, am I getting billed twice for the same thing and that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, you know, I think in all of this there's, like uh, organizational challenges working in any size company in terms of like, you know, how do you do these things? Like ideally we could work in like, you know, an AWS model where we could just charge people for what they're using, but like you have budget cycles and, <laughs> you know, you, you, people wanna know upfront like how much money we're gonna spend this year. <laughs> and that's a hard thing to kind of work around. We, we, we've done a pretty good job of making it so that we can shorten the time from when you make that business decision to spend the money till we have it ready for you. We, you know, we have a decent amount of hardware that we just keep on stock, ready to go, if you want, you know, when someone says I need a new cluster, we're not buying a new cluster for them, right? It's there already and we just work, turn it on for them, um, that kind of stuff, so that. No, we'd rather no. people actually either do it in the same index by like kind of versioning their records or uh, uh, or uh, you know come up with some other solution for it so and that's something we do up front like we look at p how people are doing things like today and say like well the way you're doing it right now that's great and that you know maybe has worked for you for a while but that doesn't really make sense so why don't we like work on a way that we can have you change the way you're doing things uh, and so it because we have that entry point into all those teams we kind of I, I wouldn't say we have authority because we definitely don't but we have the ability to voice that and say hey you know make this change for the better it's going to make your application better, whatever it is, and work with them. So. You also have different environments that sort of zone through. You're not like deploying directly to cloud. So you're yeah. only, you only need five people to say, you know, keep voting on this side and keep voting on the other side. Yeah, that's what we actually yeah. Yeah. Uh, You got a question, sir? I'm just curious, does the load testing, like, is this the same production or error in the morning? 
uh, we have like a alpha environment that's scaled basically close enough to production, but then we also have like uh, hardware in our alpha environment where if someone wants to uh, do full scale production testing, we can just move their whole cloud to a new set of machines like at runtime and then they can do their performance testing there and then when they're done with it, we can just move them back to wherever they were so that they don't have to take up that performance testing cluster. We also do a lot of our performance testing in like a, already in a dis disaster recovery scenario. So assume, you know, data, cent data center failure, machine failure, okay, now can, your, can you support your query load or yeah. ingress load or whatever you have. All right. All right, no more questions. Uh, we'll stick around if you guys have any other questions, but otherwise, thank you. Thank you very much.